views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome, I'm the Doc Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS and welcome to Open BXRX. We have another fantastic show lined up for you. In fact, coming up on today's show, we'll speak with the representative of an app that is encouraging residents in our community to support local restaurants. Then we'll hear from an author and illustrator who found inspiration right at home when writing his most recent book. And then we'll speak to, to the executive director of an organization that is uh, fighting to address a serious problem that is severely impacting our city. And after that, Bobby C has the latest in the world of sports. And then we'll hear from the representative of an organization that is doing great things right here in the Boogie Down Bronx. All of this and more headed your way because hey, we're open. Dr. Bob Lee, and you're watching Open. It's the live interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. You can stay connected to us through social media at BronxNet TV. Leading things off, we're going to kick it off nicely. Our first guest is the restaurant advocate of Palatable Incorporated, which was created to connect local restaurants with Bronx residents that are looking for healthy eats in an effort to increase support for restaurateurs during the pandemic. Please welcome to the show. Julie Bonsanti. Julie, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, Bob. Thank you so much for having me today. Yes. Julie, uh, everything's wonderful. You look great. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us about the, the organization that you're working with, Palatable Incorporated. You're a great advocate for them. Tell us more about them. Absolutely, will do. So Palatable has been around for about three years now. Um, it originally began or was born for two reasons. One is to help people, you know, find local spots nearby and to help people find the type of food cuisine that they're looking for, along with, you know, any diet restrictions, any allergies. What Palatable does is it filters that in so that you are only seeing dishes and specials that cater to your palate. Um, I like it. So that was, yes, yeah, so that it's really awesome. So that was um, sort of how Palatable was born. Now, my journey with Palatable began last year before this uh, crazy virus came uh -huh. along. Um, I was actually at the Restaurant Expo at the Jacob Javits Center uh, oh, yeah. in February. Yeah. That was great. I, you know, I started with Palatable just as a brand ambassador, just to spread the word to local restaurants mm -hmm. and share what we can do for them, how we can support them. Little did we know a couple of days later, we would be hit with this craziness and um, all restaurants were sort of forced to shut down. So what we did was we revamped our mission to not only support these healthy options, these you know, vegan vegetarian spots, but all yeah. local restaurants, all of them. I'm, I'm loving it. I need to know more about it because, you know, I love to go out to eat and I love to eat healthy. Um, Michael Absolutely. Nobby and I, we go to Arthur Avenue. We're over there all the time exploring the different things and we check out the desserts also. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Now the, now, the cool thing, what's really cool is that if you were to use Palatable, which you definitely should try it out, uh -huh. um, if you're in the mood for a dessert, say you just want a donut or something, you could actually search by that as well. Yeah. So it's not just connecting you with the restaurant per se, but it's also connecting you with their specials, their deals. Right now, a lot of these restaurants are struggling. They're putting out their chef specials and deals for the week, and they're heavily dependent on takeout and delivery. So yeah. one major thing that we're helping the restaurants with is getting more orders without having to pay commissions or any per order fees so they could keep that money. Yeah, and now Julie did have the app out now, right? Mm-hmm. So the app is palatable and that is for uh -huh. the consumer side. 
where the restaurant side uses Palatable Pro, which is basically their back office showing any orders coming in. If they would like to blast out a special, it go ahead. It can go ahead and do that for them. Um, and it's just like more than one tool for the restaurant. We have met with so many different places. We spent the past two years just meeting with restaurants, seeing what they want, you know, catering to them. And our team wants to help these restaurants. We're not trying to, you know, just bank on a tragic time. So yeah. we're providing more tools than just putting their menu up for people to see. We have a lot more to offer than that. And I think they're going to use this way after the pandemic because, you know, I think a lot of people are getting used to um, getting involved in such um, apps like uh, Grubhub and Uber Eats. How does it differ? Or is it the Absolutely. Same? Or is it like, so, is it similar? So, okay, this, the one similar aspect between Palatable and other third-party apps is that, yes, we do have a digital menu for each restaurant and we connect locals and even people who are, you know, just passing by, it's not just locals, people, you know, are visiting different areas to check out different, right. different types of food. So we're connecting them to the menu, which is similar right. to those other apps. However, what we can do is um, provide a personalized menu per person. So like I said earlier, depending on your yeah. allergies, any diet, you will see the full menu, but you also will have the options to see only the items that you like. For instance, if you have a fish allergy and you're tired of seeing all these different fish specials, those will not pop up for you. Um, another thing that sets you us can apart. Customize, you can customize your app, basically. Yes. Everyone has their own personal menu for each place on our app. Um, mm -hmm. Also, we handle marketing and social media for our restaurants. So we don't just sign them up and then kind of leave them. We provide 24 hour support. And if they have something special, we put it on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, no. and our website. So we're helping them with that. And the really, my favorite thing actually. What um, is that? <laughs> it's the fact that Palatable has the option for you to swipe dishes left or right if you like them. So when you're hungry, but don't know what you're in the mood for, all you have to do is click the swipe option and it, all of the different dishes in your neighborhood pop up. So if you have no idea what you want to eat, you could just swipe and say, oh, that cheeseburger looks really yummy because we use images, real, real images, not stock photos. Right. And then you could order right from there. So it's a really cool app. Um, it caters to everyone's needs. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to wash dishes. No, you just swipe them away. <laughs> and you know, these restaurants, they need the relief, they need the support um, and they're struggling. So what we have found is that they, out of fear are joining all of these third party apps, not realizing how much money that they're actually losing from oh. them. Um, you know, they feel the need to be on Uber Eats, Grubhub, Postmates, Chow Now, you yeah. know, all these different apps, which are great. We don't want anyone to just stop using them, but they are taking a big bite out of their profits. Yeah. Now, do you get the opportunity, Julie, to go around to these different restaurants and, you know, uh, you can bring a friend or you can bring Absolutely. Absolutely. You what, get these different places. So one of my passions is to eat and try new things. So it really works into my schedule, um, you know, to try out new places in the neighborhood. I I, for one, have been in Pelham Bay my whole life. I actually grew up on Crosby Avenue in the hub of uh -huh. restaurants. So I, you know, I get to visit these owners, just share some information, how we can help, and also grab a bite to eat. So it's a win-win. <laughs> yeah, you're hanging out with my cousins over there in Pelham Bay. Um, <laughs> yes. Now, do you just, um, how can restaurants get more involved in what you're doing? And does it go beyond the Bronx? Absolutely. So right now we are, branching out into different areas on the East Coast. We're in New Jersey. Um, I'm bringing this to the Bronx along with another team member. Uh, today, we're actually going to Manhattan for a little bit to the Chelsea area to visit some places. And oh, you're really... going down by the radio station, WBLS. It's right over yes. here. Yes, yes, we are. We'll be there. To... Well, we'll be around that area today. And, uh -huh. um, you know, it's, it, it's very fulfilling to be able to help your community. I was at a point where I, you know, I've been here my whole life and I was thinking, you know, maybe I should move. You hit the 20, your 20s and it's like, maybe I should get out of here. But instead, I, I 
found a way to connect and to help the community. I don't want to see these places go. We already have Giovanni's down the block that closed. Yeah. Jimmy Ryan's, one of my favorite bars, is shut down this month with the hope to, you know, open up again. Marina Del Rey, my old job, is closed for February. So a lot of the culture of the neighborhood is being affected, and that's something I'd like yeah. to preserve. Well, it's a beautiful thing. It's like you're the liaison between the community and the restaurants, and you, you know, I hate the good food. What's your favorite restaurant? Well, don't tell me because... <laughs> that's very hard to answer. Pick I know, a cuisine. I know. Pick a cuisine. <laughs> excellent answer, though. That's hard, to, that's hard to answer because you're going around checking them all out, and you want yes. everybody to get, like, you know, go out and try everybody's uh, restaurant. Yep. Yep. And it's so they can get that business and experience uh, people yep. coming in during this pandemic. Yes. Um, the information on the app, how do we get the app? I, uh, let me see. So, so we have a yep. website that you can go to. Oh, our go website, to website is, yep. Our you website. Computer. Or you could even, do you have an iPhone? We, we, we um, have power for both smartphones. Awesome. So if you go into the app store and type in palatable, yeah. P-A-L-A-T-A-B-L-E, Inc., uh -huh. it will pop up. It's free okay. to download for all smartphones. You could even use it on a tablet and a PC as well. Thank you so much. All right. Got it. <laughs> awesome. That was so quick and easy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No problem. I'll just do the rest of it when, uh, once we get off. Yep. Uh, but thank and you so much. Thank and, you. Go ahead. What I was just going to say? say, I was just going to say when you start your account, you just connect an email to it and it will onboard and ask you your preferences in terms of diet, cuisine, and allergies. And then it will filter through your neighborhood. Okay. That's the next steps that uh, you have to go through after you get the app. Mm -hmm. Super quick. Um, <laughs> that is great. Julie, thank you for all your information. You're always welcome back. And next time, you know, Maybe come back with a restaurant and display some yes. food. Or yes. when we open up our studios again, you can come to the studios and do a big display table with some of the oh, food from the restaurant. That. that sounds amazing. Right? <laughs> yeah, we can have breakfast in the morning or lunch or dinner. I'm always up for a meal. <laughs> and company. <laughs> there you are. Thank you so much, Julie. There Thank you so much, Julie Bob. Bosanti. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye. See you soon. Come back soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Don't hit me. that button yet. Wait a minute. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a break right here. We've got more open coming up next. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at bronxnet.tv. Learn, engage, inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS and Bronxnet. Hey, our next guest is an, uh, he's an author and illustrator. He joins us to, well, he's going to speak about what inspired him to write his uh, most recent book, When Good Fruit Goes Bad. We're going to tell you a whole lot about it. He's going to speak about the impact of being a stay-at-home, stay-at-home father. Please welcome to the show, Vernon Gibbs II. There's two of them. <laughs> Vernon, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Nice to see you. How's dad? He's great. He's great. He's a, um, a, a loving father and a great grandfather. You know, he loves doing, um, coming over, hanging out with the kids um grilling you know mainly eating but not so much grilling but he likes you know get in the pool and just have a good time so he's been great well send my love okay tell him I absolutely hello. absolutely right. <laughs> and plus you're working with the uh, sandra right sandra yes yeah, sandra, sandra yeah. from the bullion foundation correct yeah she's the one who connected um and my dad was connected to her and then she heard about the book and I told her a little bit about it. So we've been working together on just um, talking about the book and its message. So she's been great. She is just um, lovely. And I love talking to her on the phone, text, whatever it is. She's been great. So I'm glad that we're connected kind of through that, um, through that foundation. Yes, you are connected. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Vernon, what inspired you to write this book when good fruit goes bad? 
Um, well, I think like most authors, I know you're an author yourself. You have several books out, which is awesome. Um, mine was inspired by something that happened with my kids. My son, Justin, he was maybe three or four at the time. He had a banana that he wanted to throw out. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. it was a little brown and everything. And I was like, you know what? That banana can still be used. Let's put it in a smoothie. And I made a smoothie out of it and didn't think anything of it. <laughs> and then I said, you know what? A lot of people probably do that. I'm someone who does it myself. I know people probably see an apple or something that's a little bruised and want to throw it in the garbage. And I said to myself, that can make a good story. I wrote it yeah. down, didn't think anything of it. And then um, as I was working with my cousin on some different book ideas, this one kept coming to the top. And I was like, you know what? This could make a good book. And I think I could draw it. I have an architecture background, but I've always loved drawing comics and everything. Yeah. And then it kind of grew from there. So I just wanted an excuse really to draw funny pictures and make some rhymes, but it worked out to be a really great um, yeah. kind of that we put together. So it's out of the question to cut some of the bad part of the fruit out and, and throw it away. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> put that bad I, boy in a blender and make something nice out of it, huh? It, yeah, exactly. And so many times, especially with a ripe banana, people see it's brown and want to throw it in the garbage. You throw that in a, in a smoothie or in banana bread and you wouldn't know the difference. So that was really what I thought could, you know, that kind of message throughout a book could just be really helpful and, um, you know, fun to draw. Yeah, my father's like that too. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't throw that <laughs> away. Hold on. Wait exactly. We can put that in good use. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I never good. thought I'd be that guy, but then, you know, I'm like, wait, you know, in the same way, I'm like, oh, you, all of a sudden you turn into your parents and I'm like, oh, don't throw that away. What do you think? We just made a money. Uh -huh. like, and I'm like, oh, wait, a minute. that's, you know, that's a good message to get out to kids and, and adults. Parent, yeah. And parents love to know when you hit that threshold right there. Uh-huh. See, that's yeah. what I was telling you all along. Now <laughs> you caught on. Right, and then you're going to try to convey that same message to your youngsters. You have three of them, right? Three, yeah. I have um twins who are five, and then um, they'll be All six. Right. I have a, a seven year old, so uh -huh. they keep me busy um, and keep me and my wife busy. My wife is a, I'm a physician. She's a, a child psychiatrist in the city, uh -huh. so um, I'm home with the kids all the time as a, as a stay at home father. So I've been home with them for uh, almost five years now. It'll be six years wow. this year. So how do you um? How have you balanced your role as both a stay-at-home father, husband, and uh, educator during the pandemic? Whew. It hasn't been easy, but I feel like when the pandemic hit, I was more prepared than most because I had already been home with my kids. I know a lot of people are used to taking, you know, dropping their kids off at school, picking them up, but I had been home with my kids for four or five years until they got to kindergarten, so I felt like I was just prepared to have them home just a little uh -huh. bit more. Um, so there wasn't as big a shift. I also found myself being a resource to other parents who maybe yeah. just hadn't been home with their kids and didn't know what to do, how to keep them busy, what to do. Do you just make them watch YouTube videos all day? Do you try to interact with them? How do you balance that? Yeah. So um, it, was, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't as much of a shock to me when it happened, but it was still like, okay, my kids are home all day now. I need to find a way to also get other stuff done as far as chores in the house or get dinner ready or you know get the car fixed, different things that I could normally do if I dropped them off at school, yeah. had to find a way to kind of balance those out. So it wasn't, e it wasn't um, easy, um, but I felt like it was uh, not as hard as it could have been if I hadn't been home for so yeah. many years already. When you mentioned being a possible resource to others, to other parents, I thought uh, you were gonna go into, hey, uh, by the way, you know, we started a nursery here. <laughs> oh, <you're right. laughs> I had a couple of people who wanted to drop their kids off. Yeah. Like, you're <laughs> That's what will happen. Yeah. That's what will happen. <laughs> yeah, people, yeah, people see you with the kids. It's funny because sometimes I'll be yeah. home with a bunch of, you know, my kids and people bring their other kids over. And all of a sudden I realize I'm in the room and I've got all five, five or six kids and the parents are doing something else just because they feel comfortable with me watching the kids. Like, oh, Vernon's got it. He knows what he's doing. So I don't have to feel like I have to watch him. He'll, you know, yeah. take care of well, that happens a lot. I got to start charging when people come over. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about some of the other blogs that you participate in. Um, you contribute to other publications. Yes, yes. Um, well, I started my blog right when I started being a stay-at-home dad just because I felt like I had a voice and I wanted to get kind of my stories as a dad out there. So I started a blog at um, coolminivandad.com. You know, I have a minivan. Coolminivandad.com. All right. Yes. That's what you drive? <laughs> that's, that's Oh, you got to carry the kids around, yeah. Exactly. Hey, I mean, once we had the first one, we had a, you know, a regular size car, but once we knew we were having twins, we knew we needed something bigger. So I never wanted to be a minivan guy, but life <laughs> can't do something. You got to deal with it. Right. 
It so, sounds like a business, you know, transporting youngsters from spot right. to spot and opening up your home as a nursery. Sounds like exactly. a whole nother business, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good idea, right? Like, and then I yeah. kind of over, right? Um, yeah. I and started just keep writing. a diary along the way. You can write your books. But, right, <laughs> right, all the stories, all the, all the minivan stories that I come across. Um, <laughs> so I started it as a blog just to kind of get my voice out there as a father. And then, um, you know, I started doing some writing for, I met a guy named Spike at a dad conference that I went to called the Dad Summit. So um, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a gathering for dads who are in all walks of life, whether it's um, um, they're writers or just dads who want to see with other dads. And at this event, I met a guy named Spike and he told me about a site he has called Fathers of Multiples. And he has a site specifically for parents who have multiples, you know, twins or more. So yeah. I started writing with him, writing there. And then at the same conference, I met someone at the Washington Post and it allowed me to get um, two um, pieces written in there. One about my wife and I's, um, we lost twins at um, 19 weeks. We had twin boys and we lost them oh. at 19 weeks. Yeah, and, sorry to hear that. Oh yes, yeah, thank you. Um, but it was one of those pieces that no one talks about it from a male perspective. It's usually from yeah. the women's perspective, and I, which is fine, but I felt like there needed to be a male voice about what I was going through and kind of how I felt and you know the ideas and dreams that I had about my kids that I was didn't think it was ever going to come to fruition who knew we'd have twins you know a couple of years later you know God has a you know a funny plans sometimes for us unexpectedly so yeah. um that was the piece I, that was my first submission to the post it was admit um they loved it and then it was um in there in 2000 and I think about three or four years ago and mm -hmm. then I did another piece for them recently this last summer that was kind of talking about me balancing being a father with kind of the social and racial unrest that was going on in the country. So yeah. just- And what did you tell them? Um, <laughs> well, I told them that, you know, as a father, you know, you have an obligation to really um, talk to your kids about what's going on in the world, but also mm -hmm. to still be a light and a shining beacon to them. You can't always just focus on, um, okay, all the negative. You still have to, I still have to be funny. I still have to be a dad. I still have to take care yeah. of them. So while I can balance um, understanding what's going on as a black man and as a black father in this country and the kind of the things I have to go through and preparing them for that, I also have to um, still be a dad and still be funny and have a good time with them and joke with them and that kind of thing. I can't just kind of be like the world is against us, everything's negative. So um, yeah. it was just a balancing act that I had to do. And I, again, just was inspired by what was going on and my struggle with being funny, but also seeing things like George Floyd and seeing riots. So how do I balance that as a father? So it was a great piece yeah. to write and another one that they um, yeah. wanted to. And how do you explain that to your youngsters? That's that's another, that's probably piece number three or four Absolutely. Or and they're young too, so it's hard, you know, when they're five and seven years old, it's hard to have that conversation about the color of your skin and, you know, how people yeah. you know view you from the beginning uh, without even knowing you. So it's um, kind of a balancing act. So we're you know yeah. doing our best. Now you have a learning packet along with the book. Yes, so yeah, so one thing that we, um, as we were putting the book together, I worked with some dietitians just to get their feedback on some of the points of the book and something that we thought would be great would to be to have sort of additional learning um, information. So we have some crossword puzzles, we have fruit facts, we have kind of all these things that are in a like a 24 page free downloadable packet from the website that, um, you know, if you buy the book, you can just go there and say, you know what, I also wanna get some fun facts about fruit that I might not know about. Here's a quick recipe on how to make a smoothie. And just, you know, a fun way to kind of keep the message of the book going. Cause I think so many times with books, you read them, you're done with them, you put them away. And we kind of felt like the message of this book was more than just about eating healthy and about, um, you know, creating less waste. So we want to make sure that the educational component was really there to kind of keep the conversations going beyond reading the book. Can we pick up the book? Um, it well, it's on when Amazon. It's it's on, when good fruit goes bad. Yes, it's on Amazon. It's on um, Barnes and Noble. Um, it's on most of the, you know most online sellers. If you go to my site, coolminivan.com/slash/fruitbook, um, that's where you can find the details on the book where it's sold. But also, you can find the downloadable information packet. And one thing I'd love to do is connect with you and you're making the great um, make the great foundation to see about yeah. you know, how to get the book as part of curriculums. And that's really the, the bigger part of the book is just- That's a good idea. Yeah, because I think the message- you, you pick up mine and I'll pick up yours. Absolutely, one for one, I love it. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, that would be, that would be and great. And we'll, we'll get the, of course, we're gonna get the word out, you know, we'll let more people know about the, 
yeah. your book. Yeah, because, because I mean, the one last thing I'd say is that, you know, the one thing about the book is while it's about eating healthy and about knowing and kind of creating less waste, it's really about knowing your value and knowing that you have worth and value in spite of the bumps, bruises and scars that you have. You know, maybe you might be a little damaged from a previous relationship or just something that happened with you growing up, but that doesn't yeah. mean you should be thrown away. You shouldn't be thrown in the garbage just because you have some issues that you maybe um, you think are holding you back. Just like a bruised apple, you can still be used. It still has value. And I think, right. you know, same thing with people. Right, and everything has that beginning, middle, and end. So, yes. Although you may think that banana, that's the end of that banana. Right. Hey, it can end well. It can, exactly. <laughs> Nutritious, delicious, so, and you know, it still does a body yeah. good. And then speaking to you, I know, um, I, and I feel that you know, you have more that's coming. So you're always welcome to come back. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. You got it. All right. Right. There you go. If I was live in, a, in an audience, I would tell everybody to give Vernon Gibbs the second a big round of applause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank Vernon, you. thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, you got it. Stay blessed. All right, you too. All right, we'll take a break. I've got more on the way. It's open. Everybody, I'm the Doc Bob Lee, and our next guest is the UFT Vice President and Director of Staff for the United Federation of Teachers. He joins us today to speak about his organization's efforts to address food insecurity in our city uh, through an initiative known as We Feed NYC, and to highlight the fundraiser behind it too. So, please welcome to the show, my man Anthony Harmon. Anthony, how are you? How you feeling? I'm feeling good, Bob, feeling good. And thanks so much for having me on today. Tell us a little bit about UFT because you've been there for a while, but you've been in education for a long time also. Yeah, I'm in education for about 30 years now um, and working here at the United Federation of Teachers for I wanna say about the last you know, 15, 16 years uh, um, and, and in some capacity or the other. I'm currently serving as you know a director of staff um, for the organization. Um, a little bit of background about who we are. So the United Federation of Teachers is the, the union that represents those non-administrative titles within the Department of Education. So we represent teachers and, and um, school paraprofessionals and secretaries in the schools uh, mm. uh, and um, occupational therapists, physical therapists, um, people of that sort, non-administrative titles within the Department of Education. Um, so currently we have about uh, 80,000 uh, uh, teachers and we have about 200,000 members total. Um, uh, that's both active and retiree. Uh, um, and um, they, as I said, they represent, you know, all the non-administrative titles. So we don't have admin uh, assistant principals or principals or any one of those uh, uh, titles within, within the union. Um, yeah. So we have a, a strong history of, of standing up and speaking out you know, for uh, issues that pertain to, uh, to the educational system. I often tell people that our working conditions are the kids' learning conditions. So mm -hmm. we're equally um, concerned about, you know, our, uh, our students as we are about our own um, economic stability, well-being, and so forth, so. And of course, Michael Mongru is your president of the UFT. Um, thank you for all that you guys are doing in the community. I mean, I know because, you, you know, you reach out to me from time to time and you say, hey, we want to do this. Can you participate? Now you have a new initiative that you're working on. How did you come up with it and what's it all about? 
Thanks so much for that question, Bob. Uh, and as you know, uh, we've had we have a big history of uh, being real partners or trying to be real partners with the communities that we serve. Um, so at the beginning of this pandemic, we saw the issue of food um, and food insecurity becoming more and more of an issue. As we went into this remote world and, and students um, working from our, our getting their education at home, we had to keep the schools open to provide to continue to provide meals for, for children. Um, and as the summer progressed and we saw more and more and more that food insecurity was a big issue throughout the five boroughs of New York City. And it's not just people that are at the lower economics, you know, uh, uh, end of the spectrum. We saw middle class people now all of a sudden, you know, having difficulty making ends meet. Um, folks that, you know, um, were suffering from unemployment and underemployment, right? We saw people that had full time jobs now they're going to part time and, and um, so the economic conditions became worse and worse. Um, so uh, the the president, uh, our president, Michael Mulgrew, uh, had this idea and he challenged us to come up with some ways. Uh, what could we do to help? What could we do to help aid the children that we serve and the communities uh, um, and that these children come from? Um, and again, this is across all five boroughs, all five boroughs, Bob. Um, so one of the things that we did, um, uh, came up with this idea of this campaign, uh, We Feed NYC. Um, initially, it started uh, as a, a virtual fundraiser um, that we plan on hosting on February 13. That's February 13 um, from 12 noon to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and we're asking people to give to We Feed NYC. Uh, and they can do that by going to a, a website. Uh, it's give.uft.org. That's give, G I V E, dot uft dot org. And, and yep. on that website, we plan on hosting, you know, talent from our kids uh, to highlight the talent from our students, you know, that are, you know, really doing some phenomenal work uh, despite the challenges of being remote. Um, so we have like band and, and kids chor and, and choruses singing and so forth or whatever that we want to highlight and we want to show folk. Uh, we also have a chef that's going to be coming on and he's going to teach people, you know, how do you make that dollar stretch and how do you prepare yeah. a meal and feed a family of four for under $20, right? You know, and he, he, he's gotten on board. We have, you know, a recording artist has donated some time to, and he's going to, you know, um, a dedicate a song uh, you know, uh, to the project, you know, uh, we've asked, you know, celebrities like yourself, Bob, to come on and, and to help us to, to generate some real, cons uh, uh, some real buzz about this issue of food insecurity in our, in our city. And, you know, we want to dispel that myth that it's only, you know, uh, the homeless population that, you know, that suffered from this, this is a problem across the city. Yeah. Uh, so that was a culminating activity. Uh, but then we saw, uh, uh, again, our, our president, uh, 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 to his credit, uh, when they shut down the restaurants and there was no more indoor dining, um, it, again, challenged us as the leadership of the organization asking, what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. So we um, reached out to some restaurants that we would normally do business with, right? And um, said, hey, we want to help, you know, we, we realize that there's a shutdown of the indoor dining process, uh, but what could we do to assist you? Uh, could we possibly look at like, maybe purchasing some meals from you? And then we also reached out to community-based organizations, faith-based institutions that we could think of, that we worked with in the past, and that we've seen, you know, these lines of, uh, uh, of folk just waiting to get, you know, some something from the food pantry, because of course the soup kitchens have shut down now because of the yeah. COVID and they can't do the distance, you know, um, uh, social distancing and so forth. So yeah. the soup kitchens are shutting down, but you know, the food pantries were still open. Um, so we just took those two needs and said, what could we do to be the bridge to bring these two people, to, th these two issues together? Um, so we reached out to the restaurant and we, restaurants rather, because we did it in all five boroughs. And yeah. we asked if they could, you know, what could they do uh, a meal for six, seven bucks a pop or whatever, right? You know, that we could then get those meals delivered to these churches and community-based organizations um, throughout the five boroughs. Our goal was to provide 1,000 meals uh -huh. per week for four weeks in each of the five boroughs. So um, at totaling 20,000 meals was our goal. And what could we do to provide twenty thousand meals uh, to the to the to the folk of New York City? So, if more restaurants want to get involved, or just people in general want to get involved, what do they have to do? 
So there's, there's two ways to get involved. They can reach out to us, you know, through our uh, through this initiative. Again, that website, give.uft.org. That's uh, give, G-I-V-E dot U-F-T dot O-R-G. And uh, uh, they can reach out that way or they can reach out and call us directly, you know, here at the U-F-T. Uh, I'll be more than happy to talk to anyone uh, um, um, that would want to participate in the uh, in the project or to get involved. Um, I, I, my email address is A is an Apple, Harmon, H-A-R-M-O-N, at U-F-T dot org. That's A, Harmon, H-A-R-M-O-N, at U-F-T dot org. Yeah, so restaurants can get involved in sponsors. If, you, if sponsors want to get involved and contribute funds, they can also do that. Uh, absolutely, Bob. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, uh, if people want to go to that website, we, we, we're all, we already started the initiative. Our goal is to raise a quarter million dollars on the, uh, by February 13th. Uh, and, and, and I will tell you, Bob, we have about ninety thousand uh, dollars that's already committed, you know, to that's the great. initiative. So um, we're well on our way. Um, hopefully, you know, we we will get that quarter of a million uh, uh, a dollar mark uh, by you know February thirteenth or immediately thereafter. Um, but we're asking people, you know, to give, and you know, corporate sponsors can give five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand, whatever they or we can people can give five, ten, twenty dollars. No, sounds small. like we started the fundraiser right now. You want to shout out some of those people who. Can <laughs> Oh, sure, sure. I mean, uh, Emblem, <laughs> Health, Emblem Health has uh, contributed. Cigna uh, uh, um, Health Plan has contributed. We've got some other organizations. You know, the uh, um, I think Blue one Cross of the churches, Field. one of the churches, stepped up and said that they would, you know, uh, uh, donate and they would sponsor and they would participate. Uh, uh, Church of the Heavenly Rest. Uh, uh, so we, uh, people are just coming like out of the woodwork, and and, and they're saying, you know, I don't have a hundred, but I have fifty. I, I can give go. 25 and, and, you know, and, and that's how we, you know, somebody said, how do you just small Bring one, one bite at a time, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. So go to the website to, for all of this, mm -hmm. go website to the website for all of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Give me the website again. So it's, it's give G I V E dot U F T dot org O R G. There you go. UFT Vice President and Director of Staff for the United Federation of Teachers, Anthony Harmon. Anthony, thank you so much. And Bob, thank you so much for being for allowing us to, to, to present today. Well, looking forward to working with you. All right. Likewise, it's needed. Likewise. People are hungry and you guys are right there to help out with everything. And, God bless and you. And it's a real human need, Bob. Okay. Thank you. UFT, Anthony Harmon, coming out in a big way. Woo! We love you guys. Thank you. All right. Stay blessed. And uh, we'll catch you another day, another way. We've got the, uh, wait, oh, Bobby C has the latest in sports coming up next right here on Open. is almost here it's Super Bowl week and whether you're a football fanatic or if you're just in it for the commercials and all that food comes Super Bowl Sunday a little knowledge about the big game will certainly make it much more fun come Sunday we get you ready for Super Bowl Sunday with our latest game of trivia play along and see how many of these you can answer correctly Question number one, 16 Super Bowls have been played in the state of Florida. What team has won the most Super Bowls in the Sunshine State? The Patriots, the Steelers, or the 49ers? Pittsburgh has won the most Super Bowls in Florida, and the Steelers and the Patriots are the two teams with the most Super Bowl victories. This year's edition of the big game is in Tampa Bay. 
Question two, what player has scored the most total touchdowns in Super Bowl history? Options are Jerry Rice, Emmitt Smith, or James White. The answer, San Francisco great Jerry Rice has eight. He also has the most all-purpose yards in Super Bowl history. Number three, what quarterback owns the record for the most yards thrown in the Super Bowl with 505 yards? Options, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, or Drew Brees? You're back on the clock. He's got the most playoff wins ever for a signal caller, and come Sunday, he'll be the oldest to ever play in the game. The correct answer is Tom Brady. Question four, 10 states have hosted Super Bowls. Which of the following states has not hosted one? Options, A, Michigan, B, Minnesota, or C, New York? Kind of a trick question here. The tri-state area hosted a Super Bowl in 2014, which our Bronx Tech cameras captured, but the game was played at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey. That means New York has never officially hosted a Super Bowl, even if the two teams call MetLife home. Calling all TV buffs. A stunning 29 of the 30 most watched American television broadcasts of all time have been Super Bowls based on Nielsen ratings. What is the only non-Super Bowl program to break into the top 30? A, the final episode of Seinfeld. B, the final episode of MASH. Or that big episode of Dallas, Who Shot JR is C? The correct answer is MASH. That was all the way back in February of 1983. So how are you doing so far? Final five questions coming up. Number six, all-time great coach Vince Lombardi made a name for himself in the Bronx first as a player at Fordham University. He's arguably the greatest NFL coach of all time. And the Super Bowl trophy is named after him because of it. How much does the Lombardi trophy weigh? A, five pounds. B, seven pounds, or C, nine pounds? Correct answer, seven pounds. And it's made by Tiffany, by the way. Question seven, what artist has the highest rated Super Bowl halftime show to date? Janet Jackson, Katy Perry, or The Weeknd? Jackson's wardrobe malfunction, believe it or not, is not number one. The Weeknd performs this Super Bowl Sunday. The right answer here is Katy Perry in 2015. Number eight, who was the first left-handed quarterback to get a Super Bowl ring? Boomer Esiason, Michael Vick, or Ken Stabler? Oakland Raiders great Ken Stabler is the first lefty to win the big game. Number nine, how many chicken wings are consumed on Super Bowl Sunday? A, 1 million, B, 100 million, or C, 1.3 billion? Most recent numbers say 1.3 billion. It could actually exceed that number this year. The National Chicken Council says if 1.38 billion wings were laid end to end 
They would stretch 28 times from Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, Massachusetts, all the way to Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum in California. That's an awful lot of chicken wings. And final question, who is the only player to win Super Bowl MVP on the losing side? Tom Brady, Joe Montana, or Chuck Howley? Linebacker Chuck Howley is the only player to win MVP for a losing team when his Dallas Cowboys were defeated by the Baltimore Colts in Super Bowl V. Brady has won the most with four, followed by Montana with three. Thanks for playing our Super Bowl trivia. We hit the C-list for the player I think will win MVP come this Sunday. Here's my Super Bowl MVP and game prediction too, right here in the C-list. As Super Bowl matchups go, it doesn't get much better than Tom Brady versus Patrick Mahomes, the GOAT versus the kid. Fans in every sport like to imagine what would happen if the best players from different generations could somehow face off against each other, especially when they're in their primes. Babe Ruth against Hank Aaron, Michael Jordan against LeBron James. Well, NFL fans don't have to wonder this time. Past and future will meet at center stage in this year's Super Bowl between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Brady trying to win one more title while Mahomes looks to further a legacy that one day might actually eclipse Brady's. This will be Brady's 10th Super Bowl appearance and fourth in five years, and his six titles are more than any quarterback. He has been in the NFC for all of 10 months, and he's already won as many conference titles as both Breeze and Rodgers. Mahomes, meanwhile, has already established himself as the face of the NFL for the next decade. He won NFL MVP honors in 2018, his first season as a starter, and will be the first quarterback 25 or younger to start two Super Bowls. He and the Chiefs are trying to become the first team to repeat as Super Bowl champions since the 2004 season, when, guess who, Brady and the New England Patriots did it. Since losing to Brady and the Pats in overtime of the 2018 AFC Championship game, Mahomes is 30-4 as a starter. That includes a 23-16 win over Brady and the Patriots last season and a 27-24 win over Brady and the Buccaneers in Tampa Bay in Week 12. The Vegas line has KC as slight faves and paints a picture of another close game, maybe a field goal game. I think Mahomes will be out to seek revenge when it matters most, but yet I just can't seem to shake what Brady is doing this year. And I think Tampa is better than they were in Week 12. Something Drew Brees and the Saints and now Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers can attest to when it comes to talking about Tom Brady and the Bucks. I'll take wisdom and experience over youth. Tampa 31, KC 27, Tom Brady, MVP. That's your sports. I'm Bobby C. Welcome back. I'm the Doc Bob Lee. Our next guest is the executive director and administrator of the Van Cortland Park Alliance, and she joins us and joins the program. She's going to be speaking about uh, the services that the organization has to offer. Please welcome to the show, Stephanie Ehrlich. Stephanie. Hi. Hi. Good. So nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Is that the park behind you? I mean, I love it. Makes that is you want to go park. out and take a walk in the park. That is it. That is Van Cortland Park right behind us. Pretty gorgeous, right? It's lovely. Yep. Like you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tell us more about the park. Well, uh, the park is uh, huge, uh, and it is over 1,100 acres of, of beautiful, beautiful greenness in a city that really needs greenness. And we have been, um, you know, during these times, it's been 
I would say, uh, you know, an oasis for people who are in their apartments who don't have backyards of their own. And so we like to think of ourselves as the Bronx's backyard. Uh, And folks are coming out and doing everything, everything possible. They're playing sports, they're chilling, they're hiking. uh, And I have seen everything from weddings to bar mitzvahs to sweet 16s to gender reveal parties, you name it, it's happening in the park. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I've used uh, some of the facilities there. Sometimes when I get up from Bronx and I'll go take a nice quiet walk in the park or I'll go get my golf clubs and uh, go golf back there in the park. And well, yeah, or you can just go inside of the, the golf area. I think they have, um, what do you call the golf club? And you can go sit on the back uh, part there overlooking the water. You can watch the birds, uh, have a few uh, glasses of bottles of water. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. And that's <laughs> and a, a gorgeous spot. That's a gorgeous spot. So you're overlooking the lake yeah. and it is really lovely. We've got all kinds of waterfowl visiting us. We've got swans and geese and ducks all, you know, hanging out. You see people fishing there, which is really nice. And it is also right near the newly opened Putnam Greenway. Yeah. Which, yeah. Have you had a chance to walk on the Greenway? Not yet. Not yet. But it's coming soon. Oh, it's so nice. It's so nice. And it is a mile and a half of a uh, paved greenway. And I think it's the coolest thing. You're basically walking from the Bronx into Yonkers. So like, you know, one foot in Yonkers, one foot in the Bronx, but all through the yeah. park. And so people are using it for cycling, for walking. Uh, it's fully accessible, ADA accessible. It's, it's a great, great thing. Now, if I walk from the Bronx to, to Yonkers, how long is that? Uh, it's a mile and a half, and I guess depending on your, um, you know, your speed, it could take you yeah, 25 minutes. It's like three miles, mile and a half up, mile and a half back. Yep. Yeah. That's great. I got to try that. Do it. The <laughs> other thing know. is that, I don't know, do they still have the horseback riding? I used to go horseback riding. Over there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so saddle up. We have the stables, and it's funny that you say that. My grandma used to ride in that, um, right in the park, too. Now, why are you linking me up with your grandma? No, I'm just saying that I have, I have Bronx uh, bona, bona fides. <laughs> <laughs> but they still have it, though. They yeah, do, I they haven't do. been horseback riding in a while, but, you know, <laughs> that's what I used to love to do also. <laughs> so, yes, and, and we have, the, we, have um, we have two golf courses, which you mentioned one of them. So that's a great thing that people can come and do. We have a track. People run around the track all the time. Uh-huh. Uh, we have, obviously, tons of fields. People play soccer, uh, baseball whatever sport, cricket, lots and lots of that going on. And people really, I think, doing a good job in terms of uh, safety. Again, you know, with COVID, people are spreading out and taking it seriously. Most people are masking, which is really great. But what we have is we have this ability to stretch, you know, like this is the place where you can come and just, you can be six feet apart, 60 feet apart. And it's just exactly, Uh, it's, uh, you can breathe. You can, you know, get your head together if you need to do that. It's a really, really yeah. uh, important resource right now for everybody. Put a blanket down, bring a picnic basket. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Just yeah. enjoy the weather. And I love the park. I love Van Cortland Park. I love everything about it. Um, That's great. And as soon as the weather breaks, well, you know what? We don't have to wait until the weather breaks. It's we can good. go for a walk. You said the Green Mile? The Greenway. So the Putnam Greenway, Greenway. it's really easy to get to. Uh, It is, you know, you can access it pretty, pretty easily if you're coming from Broadway, from the west side, or uh, if you're going, it's right there by the golf house. So uh, you can park if you're driving. It's, it's really quite, quite easy to get to. I love it. Any projects coming up that we should know about? Oh, so much going on. Uh, We are, um, well, first of all, I want to invite you and everybody to come and volunteer with us. Uh, and you can go to our website, vancortland.org. We have regular volunteer days. And I do want to just shout out to our vital volunteers. They have been an incredible, incredible help uh, throughout all of this. You know, Parks Department, I'm also a Parks Department person. We experienced some very serious cuts in the budget this, this past year. And so uh, we did not have the staffing that we ordinarily do over the summer. And it was um, volunteers who really stepped up and helped keep the park clean. Uh, We had regular volunteers coming on Mondays because, you know, those weekends were really something. So Mm -hmm. coming in on Mondays to help clean up, doing some work with us on Wednesday evenings and Saturday mornings. And that is Mm going to continue. So 
you know, anybody who wants to come out and help us, we love it. Uh, we uh, just go to the website, look for dates that are coming up. And once it starts to warm up, we'll have lots and lots of opportunities. Yeah. We also have offered bird walks with New York City Audubon. Looking, oh, forward, to, yeah. looking forward to getting that going again. Uh, and we have an extremely cool uh, project that we are working with uh, as part of a team. There's a task force that was created that includes ourselves, Van Cortlandt Park Alliance, uh, and also Van Cortlandt House Museum, Kingsbridge Historical Society, and some mm -hmm. folks from the community. And it is the Enslaved People Project. And yeah. so there, um, there were enslaved people who lived in the park. They actually were responsible for building Van Cortlandt House Museum, for creating the lake. And uh -huh. there is a history that is incredibly rich and very few people know about it. So we got some funding from Community Board 8 last year to create curriculum, and that's also on our website. So it's super cool. So for um, for young people, for fourth graders, and then for middle schoolers, we've got these two curricula that are free, downloadable on our website, so people can learn more. And we are moving forward with some things. We're gonna, I don't want to say too much, but we've got a lot. We've got a lot on the horizon. We want to make it possible for people who are visiting to be able to have a digital tour. So you know, there's like a QR code oh. on your phone. You can go and stop along the way and get some information about it. And then as we go forward there, you know, there's so much we can do. Stephanie, thank you so much. You know, I, I, I feel like jumping out of here now. I mean, I'm pulling my hair out. You know, we do the Zooms from here. We do radio. We do TV. Everything comes from this little studio right here. That's amazing. <laughs> That's why I got to change the background. So send that to me. <laughs> I will send that to you. I will send that to you. Although yeah. I have to say, I love seeing records. So yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I have uh, every format. I have it in the computer. I have the CDs. I have the 45s. I have 12 inches. We got we got the albums. We got everything here. Oh, how cool! <laughs> and what's what's your what's your favorite? What are you? Are you a jazz guy? Or are you like what's your what's your genre? What, you mean the, the type of music that I play? Yeah. Well, I I have everything. You name yeah. it, I can pull it up right away. You know, but um. I get hired to, to play just about anything. I do a lot of weddings. Uh, we do a lot of private parties. We do corporate uh, engagements. So any kind of music that they want, I can I can do. I can do Indian music. I can do Jewish music. I can do wow. soca, calypso, reggae, uh, reggaeton, uh, Spanish <laughs> music, salsa, R&B, oh, oh, cool. house. Yeah. Oh, maybe we so. can get you into the park. Oh, we can do a big thing in the park. We bring a sound system also. Yeah, we bring a big sound system. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, we'll, talk <laughs> we'll talk well, about that. That'd be great. Yes. And thank you so much for coming on. When you have something coming up, just jump on again and let us know what's going on in the park. Absolutely. This is my pleasure. And and again, I wanna I wanna thank you for, for having me on and I wanna, you know, invite everybody to come to the park. It is, you know, it is the place to be right now. There you go. All right. Van Cortland Park Alliance, Stephanie Ehrlich. The Executive Director Administrator for Van Cortland Park Alliance. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't thank you enough. Have a great day. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Unfortunately, this is all we have for today's show. And I want to thank our guests for joining us and you, our viewers, for tuning in and checking it all out. And to follow us, you know, well, go to BronxNet TV for continued coverage. Thank you for letting us share in this space and time with you. For all of us here at BronxNet, have a great and enjoyable day. And we love you, love you, love you. Stay safe and always remember this. What you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice and let your choice control the chooser. And whether you say you can or you can't, either way, you're right. I'll catch you over the radio on 107.5 WBLS. I love you all. Peace.